Hello and welcome to Shifting Left, an app dynamics content series for people who want to learn faster, build smarter, and innovate more. My name is Adrienne Jack. I'm part of the webinar team here at AppDynamics, and joining me here today, we have Gina Na, our product marketing manager and expert in all things DevOps and go-to-market strategy. In fact, fun fact about Gina, um, for her interview at AppDynamics a couple of years ago, she actually outlined the segmentation and GTM strategy for different types of cheese. Um, and it's that strategic mindset that I'm excited to tap into today. Um, so welcome, Gina. Thanks, AJ. Happy to be here. <laughs> cool. So today I'm talking to Gina about a challenge that we believe doesn't get enough attention, um, yet is so painful for DevOps that we've been doing a lot of research into it um, and recently trying to innovate around it. And that problem is battling inefficiency as technology environments grow increasingly complex. Um, and Gina has learned a lot from customers about what that means for the dev, op, dev and ops professionals on the front lines. Um, so we've got lots to share. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate you jumping on. Um, before we get started, I'm obligated to share this safe harbor statement. Um, and we have a few more important housekeeping items. So firstly, note that the console you're looking at is completely customizable. Feel free to explore the widgets at the bottom of your screen. You can also move or resize any of the windows you see open by dragging the bottom or top right corners. Also note that webinars are bandwidth intensive. So closing any unnecessary browser tabs will help conserve your bandwidth. Um, if you're still experiencing issues though, either with sound or the screen seems frozen, um, refreshing your browser usually fixes it. Um, but if not, reach out to us through the Q&A widget just below the screen and we'll try and help you out. Do feel free to ask Gina questions there too and we'll answer as many of those as we can. Um, at the end of our conversation or offline if we're not able to get to it. Um, cool, so let's get started. So Gina, my first question for you. So organizations are releasing soft software faster than ever before, right? Um, can you tell me what that's meant for development and operations teams as velocity has increased so much over the past few years, five years or so it's been, right? Yeah, definitely, AJ. So um, you hit the nail on the head. Like we're seeing companies releasing um, faster than ever before uh, because that's really the bar to stay competitive, right? Whatever people say, whether it's every business is a software business, software is eating the world, you know, whatever you prescribe to, the reality is is that organizations have to innovate faster, and so we're seeing the release cadence for these companies um, increase exponentially. On the other hand, though, or the reality is, is that applications today are also incredibly heterogeneous and diverse. Um, what I mean by that is you have applications today now that are running on several generations of technology. They have different components that are um, from times, uh, from eras past, right? So you might have, especially some of the larger organizations and enterprises of the world, they have applications that uh, may, some portions are running on mainframe data centers, but also they're leveraging the latest cloud technologies. Like, And so what you're seeing is applications that are running on these very hybrid or multi-cloud infrastructures. So right. the takeaway is that applications are really complex, right? The, the, the unfortunate reality there is though that the operating models for development teams and the operations teams is that it hasn't evolved at the same pace as the technology that they're supporting. So if you look at, for example, some traditional approaches to troubleshooting, that becomes like pretty acutely clear. Uh, you can see here on the slide where this is, take example, any sort of incident revol uh, revolving around a code related issue. What you'll see a lot of times is that operations teams are monitoring the performance of an application. They'll typically understand using some sort of alerting uh, performance monitoring tool, maybe you're using AppDynamics, uh, to be alerted when performance is degrading. 
And then you, the operations team is really in, takes the charge and tries to troubleshoot, triage, and quarantine whatever issue might be happening to mitigate any impact to end users, right? Maybe they haven't started noticing yet. And then once they actually identify that the, you know, the application's causing the issue, there's this sort of handoff that happens. But, um, and hand, they hand off to the development team to find out what's going wrong. Yeah. Um, but that, that handoff isn't always as seamless because sometimes developers need more context, then they have a really lengthy process of their own to troubleshoot further and um, actually before they can deploy a fix. So what we're seeing is that this is costing a lot to the business. It costs a lot to the individuals involved, the developers, the ops teams, but it also costs the business and the organization broadly. So according to McKinsey, what you're seeing is a really typical understanding of IT um, and, their, and, and their role in the broader business. So mm -hmm. what this diagram actually represents is the fact that what business wants from IT teams is to spend the majority of their time on developing innovative software that actually drives the business and then the other parts of the IT. But the reality is on the right hand side is that very, very little of their time is actually spent on that. And the majority is spent on what they what maybe the business deems as more mundane and they don't understand the importance of it, but really all the efforts that it takes to keep these systems running. So the ratio is quite off there if you if you look at it. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think. A lot of times when people think innovation, they think um, the latest new technology. Um, but yeah, I think when you consider that imbalance, um, while it makes sense to think about the tech when thinking about how to adjust, um, is that always really the most appropriate move? Like what else should people be thinking about? And um, like, is that always the most efficient um, solution to upgrade your technology? That's a great question. So I think what, like you're kind of circling around this, this, uh, this notion of like technology versus other things. And yeah, as uh, technology folks, you'd probably think you'd jump right to the technology, right? But the reality is actually that people are incredibly important to this process. The, the individuals, as I mentioned, the ones that are actually feeling the pain of inefficiencies and that right. long, lengthy, lengthy processes, right? So actually, in, according to Gartner, what we're seeing is that 75% um, of DevOps initiatives fail um, by, they're estimating by 2022. 20, and that's due to organizational learning and change versus actually technology, right? So what that's getting at is that people are really critical to DevOps success. And um, like I said, not surprising that you may kind of think about the people as the secondary, but in reality, what you need to do is laser focus on the people related aspects of DevOps. Um, that will really determine the, the success or the failure of any sort of any DevOps initiative within your teams and organization. Okay, so yeah, so let's dive a bit deeper into that because um, I want to understand like what agility looks like, like what what successful DevOps looks like when you um, when you're doing the right thing for your people, um, and that is more of a priority um, for agility, if that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> I, I follow your, I follow it. So, yeah, it's a very roundabout way of asking it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes perfect sense. So I think what um, like I want to highlight is the fact that when you look broadly at this notion of IT, and um, you've mentioned it several times to AJ, this notion of inefficiency, let's improve and whatnot. But I actually think that inefficiency is just a symptom of other things not working well, right? Like that should not be just the the um, the sole focus. I think that's definitely a good goal um, to improve. But um, when I talk about like this, what what success looks like, as you teed up, I think there's th key three key things to DevOps success. So when you think about it, there's people, processes, and tooling. 
So I, I use that order very purposefully. Um, let's talk about the people. And I've already started kind of teeing up that notion about how DevOps initiatives will likely fail um, due to organizational learning and culture. Um, I think when we, th when we think about the people, what's really critical there is getting everyone on board. You know, if you think about any sort of initiative or project, it's really critical to have the everyone sta key stakeholders on board, right? And I think that's a step that a lot of folks overlook when planning their DevOps initiatives and when they actually roll out, right? They, they kind of jump to, again, the technology and don't really focus on educating everyone on why this will be beneficial, not just to one team, but a lot of folks, um, or getting them really bought in and getting them excited, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, having that kind of shared excitement or understanding at least, um, not only fosters like commitment to making that transformation, but it also just fosters more of a collaborative, uh, collaborative mindset. The second portion being processes. So um, I'm, I, ta ta I mentioned right at the top of this, our operating models need to evolve the same way that the technology is available to build more agile applications that can be iterated upon have evolved. So that's where the process is coming like in huge. So let's think about how instead of having siloed teams that focus on their own tools, their own metrics and whatnot, we should really focus on, again, fostering collaboration and thinking of operating models that bridge those typical domains and maybe view it from more of, you know, what are the, the shared goals um, with any given initiative? And then the last thing being is tooling. Um, and I, again, I use this order very purposely, right? I think if you have the building blocks that are really important, I mean, all of these are important building blocks, but I think that the sequence does matter a lot. Whereas once you have the people and the team members um, bought in, excited about this initiative, they also want it because it can help benefit them. Then you establish the processes um, that actually reflect that kind of attitude and to help drive more efficiency. Then you actually can think about the tools that can help you in this process. Uh, a good friend of mine and also a coworker of ours, Marco, actually at AppDynamics, Yes. He had this really great. Marco. Yeah, he, Marco was on the first uh, the first speaker of shifting last. Uh, he always makes this great point about that organizations or individuals sometimes are really fearful of DevOps because it's this notion. It's very human, right? Like this this aversion to change and the unknown. When it comes to tooling, I think we should really think about tooling and leveraging automation not just as ways to eliminate jobs or the people, it should be about how can we help these folks facilitate, how can we facilitate their roles and some of the tasks that they're doing that's probably sucking up too much time. So it's really should be viewed as like a value add versus a replacement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so imagine, I say I'm playing devil's advocate here, I guess, and imagining that some people listening to this might have already um, implemented a DevOps model. They already think people first. Um, they already think about technology as augmenting rather than replacing, um, you know, manpower. Um, so if I already have these like basic building blocks in place, but I want to feel more prepared to maintain that readiness to respond, um, that is so like critical to DevOps, despite the challenges we see today, what needs to change or what do I need to be thinking about? Yeah. So I think like you're saying, like, what's the, the 201 version of this, right? Like, what? Let's, what? Let's think about some of the more advanced play. So I'll still stick with my three key building blocks here of people, processes, and tooling, right? But I think that there is more. So if you already have all of the great, let's start with people. You already have people bought in. Like you said, you have a, um, what, what did you say, AJ? You think you said your people first mentality? Yeah. yeah. Often, right? Well, let's take that a step further and um, see how more mature teams can do that. I like to think about um, sort of like how sports, you know, you have your starting lineup and then your backup, your tier Cs. Actually, 
this comes across clear that I don't know sports that well. I just <laughs> <laughs> same. So we'll just pretend that we know what we're talking about. It's great. Exactly. So um, identify your key players. Like it's it's great that you already have your teams really excited about the initiative, but have folks who are really champions of of it. Like that can be. Um, vocal about the importance of the DevOps initiative and any sort of DevOps projects in flight. Um, I think that some of the most successful customers that we see are folks that not just have everyone bought in, but they're excited and like cheering on and really um, even without say the person, the individual who brought forward or is the spearhead of this leader, they have folks who are cheering for this on even when they're not in the room. So identify your starting lineup of sorts, right? Um, and I think to take that even a step further, having folks across organizations um, or, or across teams, even outside of direct infrastructure operations and development teams, getting more folks, say, in the business side of um, the house bought in and becoming these champions, I think that's a really healthy starting lineup and a great way to advance when you think about um, if you already have a people-first mentality and folks um, committed and bought in. Uh, if you think about then, let's go to the processes. So I mentioned a couple of things about how we have to evolve our operating models. And so instead of just focusing on the domain, um, another more advanced way of thinking about that is really encouraging your teams to think customer first or business value first. So even as technology teams, aligning more closely with what motivates the broader organization and what are those goals and then trying to align not just the projects but also even metrics. So for any of you that are dealing with products that are very customer and consumer focused, I'd encourage you to think about what kind of value are you trying to drive through these products that you're either building or maintaining and align those metrics um, and how your team is actually measuring your efficiency and success that is more close to the customer impact that you're driving. So in other words, really understand the value um, and orient all your metrics towards that. And then uh, and, and then I think it, like as a, as almost as a, a ref, like effect of that, um, you, what you'll get is, okay, if that's kind of the, say, you know, you are some sort of uh, e-commerce application, you can then very easily um, try to reorient how your teams are actually working instead of maybe across domains, more cross-functionally when you have those shared metrics. And then um, the last thing being tooling, this is really where I think we can see a lot of um, benefits where um, the tooling can augment versus replace. I think there's two aspects to this actually. Um, understanding, it's kind of similar to the last point, understanding the technology KPIs in the context of business KPIs as well, and having the tooling that actually helps you visualize that and understand those insights is really helpful. Um, this is something that I think AppDynamics is a really good job of. You know, you, you have really great infrastructure metrics about your application, but obviously, and also really rich context into the application performance metrics. And then also oh. on top of that, you get awesome business context. So what you're getting there is like a bridging of all the worlds. Um, I think that's a really great, uh, if, as you do get to the point of evaluating tooling, understand what can unify those worlds, um, not just culturally in the organization and from a process standpoint, but actually in the tooling, right? right. Um, and the second portion of that automate, the, of the tooling being is let's see where you can leverage automation, right? So we talked about how technology can help augment and improve efficiencies. I think that's when you can get to the point of really understanding what areas could we drive more efficiencies by leveraging automation. That's a good good way to apply tooling there. Yeah, that's, that's very true. So when it comes to automation and um, like wanting to move forward with things like that, but not knowing what the first step is, I think a useful way to kind of round this all out is to, is for organizations to think about 
um, the questions they should be asking themselves to move forward in these three areas. Um, so can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So yeah, let's talk about like what, what folks can do after this and like what actions they can take. Um, so I think again, let's root it still in these three, these three key areas, right? Like, um, we got our people, we got our processes and our tooling. So, um, like, I really can't stress the people aspect of it enough. Like, I think that it's the organizational culture and having, um, everyone bought in and excited is hugely important. So, um, they can like, people can be your force multipliers in other words. So I think something that you have to ask yourself is who like who within my organization has the right mindset and attitudes that you think embody what DevOps is, what the DevOps projects and initiatives are going for, right? Like everyone understands like the idea of DevOps is that we're trying to increase speed and while also maintaining and um, improving reliability and performance and quality, right? Um, and all the meanwhile getting more efficient like, who do you feel like just embodies that? Um, and I think those people can be, uh, again, key folks to help you achieve a groundswell in your organization. So um, I'd, I'd recommend you kind of reflect on which folks can really help you be those champions or your starting lineup, as I said. Uh, and, again, and those people don't even have to be like necessarily involved directly as you think, but again, just think about like the individuals that you think are would, um, are exemplary, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the the second thing being processes, I think um, the metrics come in huge here. And then also, um, because I think as a, if you establish strong metrics that um, are more business oriented, that will help you augment your operating models. So like ask to yourself, what's really important to the business? Like what are the, like I said this before, but like, what's the objective that your products that either you're building or maintaining, what are they trying to drive? And then work from that lens down to maybe the technology and your individual responsibilities, right? Okay, so if you're trying to drive like really great customer experience, try to put those typical metrics more in the context of those business goals. And then you think when it comes to tooling, um, you should really, this is where you can think about bridging more of the different layers of the stack that all like, that are bolstering these applications and these um, customer experiences or what, like the ones that are actually helping to drive that, those business objectives. Um, I think that you really have to get really good correlation across what's happening to that front end experience or, you know, the customers with the technology that supports it. So being able to get that insight to understand that, um, I think is really critical into your tooling. So if you don't feel like you have that yet, I think that is a must for a successful foundation from your tooling. And then, as I mentioned, after that, you can start thinking about how can you automate different steps of your process and automating um, automating operating models to become more efficient. So again, the, the, the triumvirate of people, processes, and tooling, that's how you achieve that center part of DevOps Nirvana. Definitely. Yeah. And yeah, I think it's a really important takeaway that, um, the people part of that triad is really the foundation um, and obviously we'd be remiss if we didn't call out the fact that people are struggling right now, right? Working from home and feeling disconnected. Um, and we shared this actually on the last episode of Shifting Left 2, but AppDynamics is currently running um, an assist program that offers free resources and one-to-one -one help um, for people who are struggling with technology challenges, cultural challenges. Um, so I definitely encourage you to take advantage of that support if you need it. Um, you can find the link to that in the resource list, um, as well as a few more resources for learning more about optimizing DevOps and everything we've been talking about today. Um, really great information, Gina, thank you. Um, so this takes us to the Q&A portion of our session. We have some questions. 
Um, we'll answer as many as we can in the next 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, feel free to continue submitting any questions you can think of, um, and we'll get to you after the session if we don't get to it here. Um, okay, let's get started. So first question, I proposed DevOps project in my organization and it was rejected, but I think we can really benefit from it. How do I move this forward? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the, I guess I don't know if I can say age old yet, but you'll hear this a lot in the DevOps communities. And I think this is a pretty well accepted truth. Like DevOps is not a project on its own. It's not um, just one person. It's really a mindset. It really is a culture. So even if you say have an initiative or a project that would actually help manifest these mindsets and it was quote unquote rejected. I think there's a lot you can still do to um, embed and bring to life DevOps mindset and culture, uh, even without a formal bona fide project, quote unquote. Um, so what I mean by that is, you know, like we've said, people are your force multipliers. They're hugely important to any sort of initiative. And so I'd encourage you, whoever asked the question, and also for the folks on the phone, even if you don't have a formal initiative, right, you can still foster better collaboration and you can still try to implement some of the things we've talked about, right? Maybe rethink some of those metrics that have been um, how your team has measured your success so far. The reality is the business is evolving and times are changing. So. Um, I'd encourage you to still think about, um, I think that's great that you're being kind of the, the leader uh, driving change. Um, think about how you can still do all of this even without a formal project. I think something that comes to mind, right, is you can still identify those um, champions, right? So I'd encourage you to do that as you think about some of the other people that you feel are exemplary. Ask yourself, who are those coworkers that you love working with or you think are just like really stellar? Um, help, you know, get some support there. Um, even with the processes, you can, without having a formal project or initiative, you can still um, pose and ask, you know, maybe we should rethink these metrics or change how we collaborate and hand, hand off to other teams. Um, and then also the tools, like I'm sure all of you are incredibly bright people who are helping to make um, decisions with tooling all the time. So maybe you can always be applying some of the principles that you think would help with an actual DevOps, formal DevOps project to even some of those tasks that you're doing right now. Cool. That would be great. Nice. <laughs> cool. um, how can our people feel more connected at a time like this? That's, yeah, AB, AJ, you, you said it too, right? Like we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about how there's people who are struggling and especially the IT teams right now, like are the ones who are also at the front lines of their businesses, trying to keep the services up and available and performing well. So customers and um, end users are getting good experiences. So um, yeah, it's a really tough time, I think for a lot of folks in a lot of different aspects, not just professionally, but also personally. Um, like AJ mentioned, your know, app dynamics is running really great, um, no cost solutions for you right now. We can connect you to technology experts. I think as you look at some of the other maybe vendors that you work with, try to um, reach out and say that you need extra help and see what they can provide. I really think this is a time where we should be coming together. Um, I know that not just FT, but even our broader um, parent company of Cisco, they have a lot of no cost solutions. So if any of you are also you know, Cisco customers or have other tooling from Cisco, um, I definitely encourage you to check that out. There's a lot of resources right now. So, um, and yeah. if it's not publicly available, I'd say ask. I think that's a really great way to get, make sure that you're getting the support you need. And mm -hmm. then, um, if you think about just, I think that will help foster more connections between your, um, with your, your tooling and the companies that, but also I think if you think about like organizationally in your team, um, there's been a lot of articles written about this, but I really 
totally drink the Kool-Aid and I believe in it, like asking how people are doing before jumping into business. I think that really helps me when I pose that question, but also when folks ask me that, you know, AJ asked me that before we started everyone. (laughs) Just so you know. Uh, I (laughs) I think it's just understanding that we are all people too outside of our jobs that can little things that go a long way. Definitely. Yeah. Even little things like small talk, um, so valuable these days and they really do make a difference. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay. What best practices are there for communication, ticketing, incident tracking, knowledge management, et cetera? Okay. Um, yeah. So I think that that's like, when we've talked about, there's a lot of handoffs that happen. There's a lot of different players when it comes to, uh, maintaining, building and maintaining applications. Um, I think in terms of, this is actually where I do think, uh, the, the tooling can be really helpful. I'd encourage folks to evaluate, uh, communication tools that, um, not just your team really likes, but other teams as well. So especially if you are not quite yet um, what you'd consider a DevOps shop and you're still have some closer to the siloed operating model, I think um, a tool that helps folks communicate more effectively and sharing those tools I think is really key um, to easing some of, and that could be like a really good first baby step into um, changing some of the processes tools, um, the, a tool that can help change some of the processes. So opening mm-hmm. communication channels, right? Like if you're all, for example, maybe a Slack user, you can all make sure that folks are getting, um, you know, automated Slack bot like notifications when incidents are yeah. happening or something like mm-hmm. that, right? So mm-hmm. I'd encourage folks to, um, you know, if you're using, there's a lot of great providers out there that, you know, I know that our customers leverage in concert with their performance monitoring tools. So evaluate what would work best for your needs and then also what other teams would like using. I think that's a good rule of thumb. Okay. Um, In a large financial institution, how do you create sustainable, effective feedback loops for stakeholders, but especially between dev and ops? Yeah, that's, it's like one of those like more age old, that is an age old question, right? So uh, I think the, the the feedback loop is really important. And I think that I'm going to come back to the notion of shared metrics there and improving processes. It's so important that we evolve the operating models and stop thinking in the, um, like them and me context and more of an us context. And I do think that that's where having those shared metrics will help as a um, natural result. So, I, I mean, I've talked about it at length already, but really, again, those shared metrics, like really think about even, you'll find like you're a developer, you're the ops team, like I get that you have different responsibilities but maybe take a step back and again, really understand what is the goal or why is it important to have these systems up and running? Um, Why is it important that it's happening efficiently? And when you think about more of the business impact or maybe the the customer centric way of thinking of things, uh, I think that you'll see that there's a lot of intrinsic dependencies between your roles. Um, So try to think about it in that context. versus the, the, the operate, you know, it's them who needs to build it well right. and it's us who mm-hmm. needs to maintain it well. Like think about it as intrinsically linked. And um, I think that that will help foster just a more like a shared, like, hey, our success is shared. So it's not like you fail and I am going to be fine. Um, let's like, I think that kind of dependency is really great at making people want to be more collaborative. So um, I think that'd be a really great way to think about changing how you're operating and the feedback between the, the two teams. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it takes time, right? So that's okay. Definitely. Um, 
Okay, so how can we manage stress when it's compounded by the work from home culture of the pandemic? Um, any tips or ideas for managing distractions? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to provide this more on a personal basis, right? And Adrian can <laughs> also provide some tips. Oh, uh, wow. I've got so many. <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, if someone does know the like, silver bullet to this, let me know. Um, <laughs> I Yeah, I agree. Like, I think it has been quite stressful for some folks. And I think also there's been some people who um, have really benefited from spending more time at home with their family members. Um, I think that there's actually, so we... So the Cisco team has done this really awesome thing during this pandemic where, um, sorry, AJ, this is a little bit of an aside, but I'm like such a huge fan as an employee, but um, the Cisco executive leadership team hosts these weekly um, Q and A's. And this week we actually had Ariana Huffington and she was talking about how something she's created this audible recording, but she, like for her kids, she'll do this thing called like good night phone instead of like good night moon. And like, where basically they tuck in their phone and like call it good night and stuff. And I bring this up because not just because um, I wanted to talk about it, but because I do find something that's been really helpful is trying to segment some of your personal life and your work life. And even within your work life, um, like setting up time, I'm a l way more regimented about my schedule. You know, when I'm in office, there's natural distractions, but you also go physically to meetings and then you go back to your desk and work. And when you, when you don't have that as much, I think it's really important to be setting up boundaries. Um, and, and, and that helps mitigate some of the distractions that, that can come up. What do you think, yeah. AJ? <laughs> Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I think that it, it obviously depends on the person and like some people can handle distractions better than others, but like, obviously in this field where interruption is like so costly, um, there's a lot of pressure, but you know, it, it comes with practice again and this is a weird time. So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so Next question. Um, I'm in a shop that doesn't think about DevOps, but my job involves automation and the tools are moving more towards making DevOps a priority for our infrastructure. How do I help shift the culture towards a DevOps mindset? Okay. Yeah. That's a, so for whoever asked that, I think that's actually, I bet you there's multiple people on this call that that resonates with them. Again, it's really common for organizations to jump to the tooling first. And um, again, tooling is hugely valuable, but as you're, as you're posing this question, you're realizing, or that you know that how important the people aspect of it is. So how can you actually help um, foster more of the um, DevOps mindset and culture? Like it's, who's your starting quarterback, right? Like, or maybe that's you, right? You're, you're the, um, I really should stop with the sports reference. <laughs> I don't know why I'm default to Yeah. Um, think about the people who, um, not just within your own teams. I think that's great that you're already at the point where you're aut you, um, are automating various portions of your, um, pipeline probably. Uh, but, I'd encourage you to try to get other folks excited and bought in and be those again, like the individual champions that even when you're not in the room, um, really help champion why we should all work better together and more have like collaborative spirits. So um, I think that like, that's kind of helping identify the folks that can, that think like you and um, can help promote your message. But then um, I think you said you're already leveraging a lot of automation, but in terms of the processes, I'm not sure exactly what where you guys are all at, but um, if you have not established kind of shared KPIs, I think that's a really important thing to do. Um, so think about that too. I think that'd be another way to kind of really seep your organization and more of the DevOps culture versus just automating um, steps and tools. Cool. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So in the beginning, you talked about troubleshooting code issues. Do you have recommendations or tooling you can suggest for that? 
Oh yeah, yeah. So definitely, um, we have. So I think I, I had mentioned that as a specific example because again, it's it's just one example of troubleshooting. But again, when you have those operating models that are really siloed, um, what ends up happening is that you have. Uh, certain operators have their own view of the problem, and then they kind of hand off to application development teams, and they're left with still very quite costly and uh, costly in terms of time and like resources um, to figure out what's actually going on. Right. So, I we have at least I think App Dynamics again does a really good job of this, where we have a tool called Deep Code Insights, and you can actually get code level visibility in real time, even in production environments. And this, I bring up this as an example, not just because I think it's really neat, but it, I think it's um, really unique and um, kind of gets to the point of how our technology and troubleshooting should evolve. So you can um, you know, learn more about it, but I think the heart of it is the fact that instead of having looking through historical data, how can we actually get visibility in real time into our critical environments and um, collect more information that we need without disrupting these environments? Because as we know, it's going to be really risky, um, high risk in, to interfere at that point. So with Deep Code Insights, um, you can actually collect critical um, information to debug and um, pinpoint root cause of code issues. And where that can take a lot of time sifting through potentially maybe you're using um, log aggregators or heavyweight like profilers, you can actually now just collect that information real time. And then you can um, quickly identify that issue, the, the root cause again, and then the developers have what they need to deploy a fix. So that's one such tool that I would really recommend exploring. And even if not that specific tool, like how can you get a little bit more um, real time um, visibility into your applications? I think that will really significantly help in terms of um, when you do encounter performance issues that are code related, uh, those that sort of tool can really help you there. Um, yeah. Yes. What a perfect plug to end with, Gina. <laughs> um, but yeah, in all seriousness, yeah, like that that deep code, like real time visibility, is a huge component of that. Um, so yeah. cool. All right. Um, looks like that's all we have time for today. Um, thanks everybody for all these great questions. Um, again, we'll be sure to follow up with you later if we didn't get to yours. And this session will also be available to watch on demand. So we'll send that to you as well as soon as that's available. Um, I hope you enjoyed our conversation. Please do get in touch with us. Um, if you have any more questions, you can find us at appdynamics.com. You can follow or tweet Gina at GinaNar14. Um, and again, definitely check out those resources if you want to learn more. Um, we'll send them to you in a follow-up email in case you don't get a chance to download before this session closes. Um, and finally, if you like this session, we would love for you to join us for the next episode of Shifting Left, episode three. We'll be talking um, to regional CTO <laughs> Steve Long um, at App Dynamics to talk about how IT and business leaders navigate tough times, ensuring business continuity and innovation at the same time. So stay tuned for that. Um, thanks again, Gina. This is a wrap. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Thanks, AJ. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks.